Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Chris Shang. Today, we have Anthony Calio, who is an employee experience expert, has a wealth of knowledge, a couple of decades over at Disney. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to him in terms of telling us a little bit more about what he does and what kind of companies or individuals he works with. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Super excited to be here. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, I'm in the employee experience space now, and it really, uh, you know, it goes back to, um, I started in the space as a learning and development, organizational development uh, professional, and realized very soon on, and it's not revolutionary, right? I mean, us uh, folks that are in a learning and development space know this, but uh, to me, it was, um, what could I do beyond the classroom, right? Or what could I do beyond the CBT to affect um you know, a more positive outcome for employees, right? So in that case, in that setting, it was uh, learning and development outcomes. Uh, but as I progressed through learning and development, organizational development, and then starting to get involved in this, uh, you know, space that we now call employee experience, it was really came down to uh, infusing what I learned early on as a learning and development professional. And then all that real good secret sauce that I learned from Disney and the Disney Institute and the really, you know, incredible men and women that I learned from. Um, and it, again, it ultimately comes down to um, if you want to have a really successful customer service effort, and that's internal, external customers, yeah. um, then you need to have a strong employee experience uh, effort. And so that's what sort of drove me throughout my entire career. And, you know, back then we didn't necessarily call it employee experience. But it was definitely, you know, how can we create a workspace that people want to show up to every day? And so, you know, that's what I've uh, dedicated my entire corporate career to. And now um, in my consultancy, which is uh, Kaleo EX, which is all about, you know, partnering with uh, startups and small to medium sized companies to create exceptional places to work. Um, and all of that for, you know, for the reasons that not only do I personally feel like there's a moral obligation that if you're going to have employees, you know, you want to create a good work environment for them. Uh, but it also makes, it just makes great business sense. Um, it has an incredible, you know, it has an incredible ROI to it when you invest in your, in your people. Um, so I, um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, again, my, my space is employee experience and it's, 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 you know, it's what I love to do. Got it. Um, Want to kind of talk about a little bit the more of the origination of how you ended up in in this space. But real quick, um, I just wanted to go through what you mentioned. You work with startups, right? Or is that kind of like the key group of company sizes, or are you working with plethora of different sizes and stages and verticals, or is there a certain space that you have carved out a niche in? Well, you know, I think it's hard for uh, it's hard for somebody who's involved in employee experience not to be attracted to startups, right? Because yeah. the clay's not hardened yet, right? Yeah. yeah, and they have unique challenges in that. Um, and I'm at the inflection point where really it's like late stage funding companies about to really expand and grow because that's where you're at the point where uh, you're essentially turning the company over to strangers, right? And so that could be frightening. Uh, it could also be exhilarating because your company's growing. So it's strategizing with uh, the founders and the folks that are, you know, help build the company. You know, what is your culture? What should it look like? What should it evolve to? Hiring strategy, uh, those type of, you know, those type of things. So that really excites me. And then in the small, medium-sized businesses, those are the folks that really want to differentiate themselves on the customer experience side. And again, the linkage between, you know, uh, employee experience and uh, customer experience is just simply undeniable, right? And so, um, and it's, you know, about, you know, if you want your employees to wake up every morning and, and care about coming to work and caring about the company, that's what employee experience is all about. So those are my key things. Um, you know, I will, you know, I will and have consulted for larger companies. I am part of a larger group of independent contractors called the Magic Makers, and we tend to take on larger, larger, more enterprise-wide projects, but um, on an individual basis where you can really see the changes in startups and smaller organizations. Got it. Got it. Good, good, good to, to clarify that. Um, can we go back to when you first started off your career? Was this a space that you always knew you wanted to get into? And how did that come about? If not, what was like the different segues that you went through before landing on, I know you mentioned, um, 
you know, more of, uh, of employee development and, and learning um, and development. Um, but how did you end up in that space in the first place? Yeah, I love the question. And so, uh, no, it definitely was not by design, right? So I originally started out, wanted to be involved in television, right? And media production. And uh, I'll give you the short story. Uh, basically, um, did some initial freelance work after graduating from uh, with my bachelor's degree in communications, did some freelance work and I uh, was working for a major retailer and basically doing training videos for their corporate training team. Right. So we'd come in and we shot the videos and that gave me exposure to learning and development. And, you know, having that um, having that itch, which I didn't realize I had at the time of wanting to be a little bit more purpose driven, right? Corporate education uh, and corporate learning just landed in my lap, right? And so I went, you know, went to the New York Institute of, Institute of Technology, got instructional technology, instructional design, learning the Addy model. And so that's really how I got involved in, uh, in, in learning and development. It was, you know, through that exposure. And of course, you know, justifying the ROI on that, uh, on that initial undergraduate degree, I'm like, well, I could always do training videos because now I've got the production background. Yep. Uh, and anyone that's done any kind of learning and development instructional design knows that there are very, there are parallels between producing, you know, video content and content and producing learning content. Interesting. Um, I, I'm I'm personally interested because I've come from a TV and film production background myself. I spent like eight years in that space um, before I got involved in entrepreneurship and and going through the whole startup gamut for the past better part of a decade plus. But um, I I do believe in that. I believe there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of crossover in producing content or just having a production. Uh, entity and and like a film like when you create a film for example not everybody knows this but it's almost like starting and running a mini business for sure you're getting an llc you're funding it and then you are hiring employees to do different parts of it everything visually you have to contextualize in some physical component to make it work there so a, there is real magic in behind of like how you put something together um for an audience to almost you know make believe or buy into that that fiction um, but I'm curious from your perspective, uh, the relationship from production of content in the media format versus producing of content in the learning format. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and ultimately just to kind of tie up what you, uh, you know, beautifully said is it's, you know, to me, it's the power of storytelling, right? It's telling the story. And that's, you know, to me, that's the best type of learning and development. So it's everything from, you know, storyboarding, you know, and building your curriculum and understanding, you know, you're going to have that arc of what's the beginning, the middle and the end, right? Uh, so yeah, those, those parallels are, you know, those parallels are, are uh, you know, are all there. And there's a create, I, I think, look, there's definitely a science to instructional design. And whether you follow the Addy model, which I do, uh, there's a science to it, but there's definitely an art to it too. And there's that, you know, that mix to it. It's the, you know, it's the difference between um, having your, you know, having your learners enjoy death by PowerPoint or having a creative, more interactive, interactive learning. Yeah. Um, you mentioned this a couple of times already, the Addy design, for those that are not privy to what that means, can you explain what that is? And then, um, and we'll start there and then maybe dive into a little bit more about the creative side as well. Absolutely. So yeah, Addy is an acronym, you know, it stands for, you know, analyze, uh, design, uh, uh, develop, implement and evaluate, right? And it's, you know, what, what I love about the model and there's always, you know, controversy about what models you do or don't use is there's a continuous improvement to it, right? Once you launch your training, you, you've you got evaluation models and you, you've got an evaluation process built into it. So you're continually evaluating and um, almost ideating and iterating on your, on your learning. So I really think it's a great process to approach a lot of work, let alone just, you know, just alone, just uh, curriculum design. And quite frankly, it's that design approach um, and even pivoting into like human centric design that, you know, informs my approach, you know, for as far as employee experience is concerned. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what you're talking about, I feel is very much mirrors when a startup has to build a product, 
how they should be going about building a product, right? But instead of employees plugging into that var as that variable, you're plugging in customers or prospects into that variable. And so having that feedback loop, iterating, improving uh, for whatever the output is that you're seeking um, in the employee experience, I'm not as familiar with that, but what are those outputs um, versus like, you know, from a, from a sales or marketing perspective, when you're running something like that, you're, you're looking for the output of getting, acquiring new customers or acquiring more customers, right? Um, in this sense, what is the output with the employee experience? Is it, how do you measure it? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, you know, let me, let me just kind of go through the process a little bit. It all starts with an organization's missions, visions, value, and purpose, right? And how those are crafted are key. Um, and then it's really now taking those and operationalizing them, right? Because if you don't, they're just words on a poster in a conference room or on your website, and it's basically a marketing campaign, right? So how do you, you know, how do you ingrain that into your culture? And then the measurement for it is really everything from employee satisfaction surveys to what are your attrition rates, and then there are more, uh, you know, tangible direct present business results and you know what what are the KPIs that your company is measuring success on and are, are is your employees successfully executing on that um and that you know that you know that's really what it you know comes down to so there's a as I said before there's a I, I believe there's a moral obligation to creating great places for your uh, employees to work um because that's going to get the best out of them but there's also a, a business imperative to it too so the measurement can really take on um, a lot of different uh, a, you know a lot of different forms and anyone who's in the employee experience space is going to really take a custom approach what doesn't change is our framework right and how we build things but you know the measurements that we use because it's not about it's never about me or any of us coming in and installing a culture we think you should have it's the culture that you need right based on your business strategy and your employees input so it's definitely aligned with what the company needs and not only where the company's at but where it's potentially going i mean you mentioned in the beginning of our discussion a whole lot of disruptors that are out there you know we're in an election year uh, you could debate whether the economy is good or bad, right? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, disruption in addition to just the normal companies that are coming out and disrupting you from an innovation standpoint. And so, uh, you know, companies talk about, you know, not being afraid to fail and, you know, creating a, you know, a culture of change. And what separates those phrases from just being platitudes is how you ingrain them in your culture, right? And so mm -hmm. the ultimate test and the ultimate measurement is how do your employees respond to change? You know, are they leaving your, are they leaving your organization? Are you, 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 are you having high levels Are you experiencing high levels of burnout? Right. So there are a lot of different things that you can take a look at that could be symptomatic of not having a healthy culture. Uh, in addition to, again, like I said, measuring things like, um, you know, employee surveys. There's a lot of things that could be done on the HR side to make sure that you're doing benchmarking and being sure that we're giving, you know, employees the benefits and the compensation that they deserve, right, uh, for sure. Uh, so that, you know, that there's sort of, uh, you know, there's sort of things on the HR side that we can do. But as far as measurements concerned, um, it's, you know, are you hitting your KPIs as an organization? You know, are you holding on to your people? Are you creating brand ambassadors, uh, you know, what are your, you know, when your employees aren't at work and they're at a barbecue, what are they saying about the company, right? Because uh, that's probably what your customers are saying as well. So those are all things that you look at and measure uh, and, you know, and benchmark and measure against to see whether or not you've got a healthy employee experience. Yeah, interesting. Um, the super inter There's so many parallels, I feel like, based on what you're talking about and uh, on the go-to-market side of things in terms of like customer sure. acquisition, right? Um, and you you alluded to that too. Um, can you dive in a little bit deeper around uh, around that? And you mentioned uh, right when we started that, you know, employee experience and customer experience are so intertwined together. And I think especially like when we've had sales experts on, on this, you know, there's such an importance emphasized in terms of how the market conditions are right now and the ability to create, drive value through community and to build trust um, as a part of like your sales motion, which is not something we saw historically for the past 10 plus years, right. uh, especially in the software space um, because of the, we were in, in a gold rush of, of that space. 
uh, but now it's definitely being redefined. And you know, customer satisfaction and and uh, and being able to grow revenue through existing customers is so so much more of a priority. Uh, and so, tell me about what you're alluding to when you're saying the employee experience and customer experience is so intertwined because that to me is probably like the most topical prevalent layer for how RevOps teams should be looking at how to drive more revenue from customers. And it starts from employee experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's it's a great question. And yeah, it, it starts with employee experience and it really comes down to if you have a workforce that cares about your company, they're going to care about your, um, your they're going to care about your customers. And again, I want to emphasize that's internal and external, right? You know, how you treat your colleagues, how service interacts with sales, right? And marketing and how, you know, how that whole cultural piece works, um, which is like, you know, you talk about today's business conditions, that's pivotal. I mean, it's very common that somebody like me will go into an organization and quickly learn that there's a disconnect between sales and service, or there's a disconnect between market conditions and what sales originally promised the business, right? And that creates a ton of friction. Now, Employee experience is not going to go in and tell you what your sales target should be, but what it will do is create that environment and that dialogue and that safety where somebody can raise their hands and say, you know what, what we committed to maybe was right six months ago, but it's not right today, right? And that whole attitude and approach um, builds uh, morale, it builds trust, and it builds, it, it reflects on the customer service. And I'm going to tell you that you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction could be, well, we'll lean on net promoter scores to see what our customers feel about us. And what will inevitably happen is if you apply enough pressure, employees will figure out how to do just enough to get them net promoter scores that they need. And that doesn't make them bad or evil. That's just the conditions that you've set, right? And if you want them to go above and beyond uh, and, and really care about the customer, that's where you have to really rev up your employee experience and that's when you're going to start to see, um, you know, start to see real business results because the customers, your customers, there are tangibles and intangibles that the customers will start feeling about that, right? And there's, you know, so once you build that safe culture, you're going to have congruency between sales and service, right? And whatever your product is, you're going to have a good feedback loop. So you're collecting what your customers are saying about your product and your brand, and you're going to infuse that in your company, so in, into your products or services. And so that creates this like beautiful ecosystem that that is really humming along. And in this, you know, as difficult as um, a landscape it might be for some businesses, I always tell a business, forget about that. You just need to be better than everybody else, right? And so, you you know, if in, if all things being equal, you kill them with service, right? Um, and you really, you you really over deliver. You really over deliver on service because when companies start getting selective about the products and services they use, right? The ones that they decide they're going to invest capital and operating expenses into, they've got to be as friction free as possible, right? And yeah. the more angst they have in using your product or services, even if you're head over heels above the competition. Um, you're not going to differentiate yourself. How you differentiate yourself is with the service. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, interesting. I had I was I was thinking as you're speaking there um, around adoption because I've spoken to a lot of leaders, and whether you're a leader in data, uh, in talent, or in sales, when you make that jump from being a mid-level senior executive to then like a, either a C-suite or you know, a, a head of or, or VP of, like you get into a leadership position where you're managing teams. Um, it's a different skill set, right? It's yeah. like empathy, it's compassion, and it's the way you communicate ultimately to get adoption uh, from, from a group of people. And I'm thinking here from your perspective, you know, you, you laid out a lot of the underlyings of the goals of what you're trying to accomplish within an organization. Um, and, and I think obviously that's that's very clear and it's probably not that crazy of a selling point to say, hey, by doing X, we're going to see Y. But then adopting it internally is another thing where you're almost like dealing with so many different personality types and personality layers from an individual to a department, you know, a, a, a department to then the organization and senior leadership and all these different 
uh, varying, you know, varying kinds of, um, yeah, just traits of personalities that, how do you, how do you harmonize that in a way that, um, and I think that's, this is maybe how, how you differentiate somebody that does it really, really well. And, you know, and somebody that is maybe still trying to figure that out. Um, but how do you get that universal, like adoption from everybody so that it is purring on all, for all fronts? Yeah, it, it really starts with leadership and at the most senior levels. You know, if you brought in somebody like me or, or, or you know, any of the, you know, wonderful, you know, amazing consultants I know, and it's just a flavor of the day, right? Or yeah. it's just a, you know, employees know, hey, if I can outweigh this, you know, three, four months, it's going to go away. Senior leadership has to be 100% bought in. And that's mm -hmm. where you can make, you have to start making some of the most difficult decisions. And listen, the learning and development organizational development person in me wants to save everybody right and it but it's not always possible and so when you have it's easy to manage out individual contributors when they're not buying into you know in, into the culture it gets magnitudes more complicated and rarer to manage out senior leadership but it's an imperative because unless you walk the walk and talk to talk um Employees are going to know that we're not. This is not. This is not a serious effort. So it really does start at the very top, at all senior level. Senior level. So you got to make sure that there's alignment at that level. And you mentioned, you know, sort of the progression of a sales leader and a sales executive. You know, it's not unusual, particularly in smaller companies, that that individual never got any formal training on how to lead. Yep. Right? They're killing it as a salesperson, yep. and they know sales extremely well. But, you know, and it, this is a common thing, you know, across industries and roles, but, you know, have they been coached up on how to be a leader? And then are they being, are they as in fully enabled as they should be? Because what I've found working with a lot of really good sales leaders is, you know, they turn around and tell their leadership team, hey, I've got all, not only got to be co uh, selling, but I've also got to be coaching my people. Inevitably, they'll hear, well, just hire salespeople. And you don't have to worry about doing that. Now, you and I know that there isn't a high functioning uh, sales team on the planet that doesn't do continual coaching, right? And and peer to peer and also leader, you know, leader to, uh, you know, individual contributor. And so unless you have, you know, senior leadership really, you know, really locked in on this, you're not going to achieve, you're really not going to achieve, um, you know, cultural change. And I listen, I'm a half glass half full person, but I've been involved in way too many insurgencies and grassroots efforts to know that you're going to affect, you're going to have an effect to a certain level, but unless senior leadership's on board, the rest of the organization is not going to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Uh, next question here is, you know, more so um, things that you've been seeing as you've been you've been at this for several decades now, right? And I think you've seen a lot of different cycles. Uh, we talked about a few pressing things in the short term around election year, around macroeconomic environment, around AI tech and, and disruptors and stuff. Uh, but this is this is nothing new. I mean, there's always been something that's going to change the landscape for the next few years or, or, or the thought of it is uh has always been out there that fear um and you've actually lived through quite a bit of those and so what are the things that you've seen as the biggest changes um in your space in the past like the past few years leading up until now um and then what do you imagine like the the short-term changes or the short-term impacts to be that's really going to uh either disrupt or just a, or cause you guys cause the employee experience uh industry to um to evolve yeah no i love the question and really it's uh and this is going to be a self-serving industry statement i'm heartened by the uh seat at the table that um human um you know um human resources chief people officers are beginning to have at the table and they're just seen as an asset to help drive business. So it's, you know, it's, we're going, moving beyond the higher fire risk mitigation HR, which again, there are things that 
an HR function needs to do from a governance and compliance standpoint, no question. But the real value is in talent strategy and talent acquisition strategy and helping uh, helping lead and facilitate culture. Now, again, they're not, it's not a sole HR function to do any any of those things as far as culture is concerned. That is a that is a team effort for sure. But as far as, you know, I, I look at it as like, you know, as a, you know, constant gardener stamp, mm -hmm. gardening standpoint, right? Where you, you know, establish the fertile ground where a good culture and, and good practices grow. So, you know, coming back to your question, um, not only am I seeing a maturity within the HR function of understanding that, listen, we need to understand the businesses that we support, right? And we need to show, um, we need to show uh, the organization that we can provide we, we can provide value, right? And it's not just a higher fire, you know, our, and benefits, right? It's the we can help we can help drive businesses. And I think the organizations that are getting that and finding the right people that know how to do that, I think are the ones that are going to, you know, the ones that are going to be extremely well, you know, well off. And I think, you know, if you look at the 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 conversation out on uh, LinkedIn, um, I see long, uh, very well established uh, practitioners of HR starting to talk about employee experience and the importance of, you know, having leadership at the table um, and 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 being at that table. So I think that's a very, you know, that that's a positive trend and. I really do think that the um, workforce is going to have a huge say in this, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, quiet quitting or now we have quiet vacationing. There's a lot of angst happening amongst the workforce there. And there's, you know, the workforce is going to come in with what I feel is reasonable expectations about work life balance and not, you know, you know, work-life balance is a phrase that we've used for years, right? But for the most part, it was organizations, that was a, a platitude. It wasn't a real, real thing. So it trending in that, while there's clear resistance to a lot of this from a lot of businesses, it's trending in that direction. And I think it's, you know, it's a, a realization of businesses that want to differentiate themselves that are going to embrace that. And then it's just going to be a demand of the workforce. And I'm not even talking about, you know, a generational thing. I think this is a cross generational thing where, um, you know, folks that have been, even folks that have been in the workforce for a long time are recalibrating their expectations of what an employer is going to deliver to them. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the pressure is coming from multiple places from a business. And if you're going to ignore it, it's going to be at your detriment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and last question here would be, uh, you know, around maybe some of the use cases that you've seen, but what are some quick takeaways that a leader, senior leadership, whether it's, it is a startup or in the startup in the sense of the kinds of companies that you work with, which are later state, later, later stage funding rounds, uh, ready for hyper growth, raising growth, raising growth capital, that kind of thing. Um, but how do you, like, when should when should they be prioritizing this? And I, I, and and maybe there's two hats that you're wearing. One is like your your hat from the employee experience expert, and and then separately as a hat where it's um, maybe empathetic to whatever the small team is and that small group of leaders looks like, and what they're trying to prioritize within their organization of you know of of like appeasing board members and 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 investors and all that stuff. Um, but how do they find that balance and when should they, sh when do they really need to start prioritizing the employee experience as part of their growth model? Yeah. So, uh, it really is a, you know, a, a phrase that they'll all be familiar with, right? It's a, it's a, it's a crawl, walk, run, uh, you know, approach. So very early on, while, you know, you're not going to be necessarily worried about missions, visions, value, and purpose, Right. Um, very early on, what you want to do is, you know, you want to look at coaching, right? Um, you know, how have you, you know, as ascended to the role as a founder and what skills do you, you know, do you have? And, you know, how do you want to show up as a leader, right? So it's, it can, you know, it can start there. And then it's individual, you know, it's individualized training for, you know, some of your smaller teams. And then you kind of escalate from there as you, you know, as you start to grow. And if you're going to go through, you know, if you're going to go through some serious growth, then you can start installing things like talent acquisition plans and, you know, in, in those type of things. You know, when you hit, 
you hit a, a, a founder or a startup with those type of terms, their head starts spinning, right? And that, that's just not the right approach. You need, you need to grow, you need to grow with them, right? But they should be thinking about this. Um, you know, they should be thinking about this day one. And when I mean day one, it's just thought partnership. You know, reach out to somebody like me and have a, you know, a one hour Zoom call. I'm not talk even talking about it like a formal, formal consultation or anything like that. You know, just, you know, um, you know, and then, you know, really start, you know, start from there. It's, you know, it's because any good practitioner of this uh, space will be able to, you know, crawl, walk and run with you and, and, and grow with you. Uh, as opposed to, I mean, the, the, you know, the, I think the mindset is usually we'll grow into that, right? And we'll, you know, when's the right time to bring in a chief people officer, right? And those type of questions, you know, the earlier that you can start having conversations about what your strategy is, right? That yeah. way you'll have some sort of sense as to what type of chief people officer do I need for my organization, right? Um, and so the sooner you can start having those conversations and be thinking about that, the better, because that's going to, you know, on the coaching side, it's going to help you show up better for however sized your team is. It's going to allow you to also show up better for uh, when you're talking to your investors or your prospective investors, right? Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pressure on founders, right? You know, and, and so, you know, there's an expectation that they're going to have all the answers. And so for them to be able to go and turn to, uh, um, you know, a, a confidant and say, hey, listen, this is where I'm struggling. These are the, the, this is the help. You know, this is where I need some help, I think is invaluable. So, um, you know, it's that, you know, it's not just the, um, it's not just the, oh, we're hiring a bunch of people. It's, you know, what you know, and, and, you know, what do we want to accomplish as an organization and how do we not lose sight of that secret sauce that started making us successful? Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Um, interesting on that, on that note, I know we're over time, but I wanted to say so, so much. Thank you for spending the time to this very insightful conversation, got my gears turning too. Um, but, uh, I, I know your time is valuable. So, so thank you again, thank you again for sharing it. Yeah, listen, thank you so much, Chris. I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed speaking with you and I appreciate the opportunity to share. Sounds good.